Good morning, everyone. Guys, we have got nuclear weapons for Ukraine. We've got the collapsing front line in the east. We have got the British Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. And of course, you know, he's not making his own decisions, saying that British troops will be, and again, you know, British troops will be, will enter Ukraine. Now, he's not said that, but I'm going to go through the subtext and tell you what he said and then what it actually means. We have got the Ukrainians' ammunition capacity just failing leaps and bounds. And guys, as, as a backdrop to all of this, we have got the failing state in the United Kingdom. Guys, what else have we got to talk about? Guys, I'm going to do a separate video on conscription. I'll probably do that later on today. But the, the reality is now, if you live in the United Kingdom... There are things being put in place with the broken economy, the new laws saying that if you're of a certain age, you know, you are going to have to work or we're going to stop paying you your um, your free money. Guys, the situation's wild. The situation's out of control. We are heading towards a global conflict now of an industrial scale. How many times have I said that? How many times have I told you what's happening, what's coming in the future? Guys, if you don't, if you're not paying, if you're if you're not paying attention to the news and what's happening, and if you're not reading and understanding the subtext, guys, you really need to look out for what's coming because then when this happens, when the Karen factor hits the supermarkets, when all of a sudden every councillor Everybody in local government who's been given a little bit of power. Guys, we've seen what's happened. We saw what happened in 2020 when we had shopkeepers given loads of power over, over what you can and cannot purchase. When we've seen local governments bringing down absolute draconian laws on everyday people. Guys, and what was it for? What did we achieve? Well, you know, there's bit, there's big arguments on what was actually achieved or rather what was not achieved. So, guys, let's just get straight into it. So, the, in fact, guys, let's just share the front line in Ukraine. Uh, I think I should do this. Every, in fact, I will do this every video, guys. OK, so this is the situation right now from the front line in Ukraine. And guys, if you've not done so already, please like and comment and share my stuff. It's really important when you guys do that. So where are we? Uh, here we are, guys, on the map. So this is the map from the 26th of the 10th, 2004. Sorry, 2024. That 2004 was a long time ago. Um I want to keep focusing on this key location here, guys, of Pokrovs. Remember, you know, the, the Russians have held 10 kilometers away. At 10 kilometers, that is well within range of 120 millimeter mortar. Now, I don't want to get too technical, guys, you know, because I know a lot of people, you know, they don't understand these different weapon systems. But the 120 millimeter mortar system in, um, you know, in the, in the Russian army, it's, it's used by frontline troops. This is not an art artillery asset. This is not, um, you know, a brigade asset. This is used at company level. So it's used by frontline commanders. And that's why I believe they've stopped at 10 kilometers here. Again, many, many videos ago, I said they're going to come round to the south and they're going to also hold at 10 kilometers and then they'll come from the north it's a pincer movement it's like the oldest tactic i think known to man it's what they're going to do in and around pokrovs they're going to encircle it from the south first then the north and then they're just going to close that circle and at that point that's where you're going to see the you know the mass casualty rate from pokrovs pokrovs right now is a fortress city although if it was in the united kingdom it would have been classed as a city You've got two railroads, one from the north and one from the south, and then you've got these two main supply roads going north and going south. I would say that they're decimated at the moment, these roads. You know, I've not been there. Well, I have been there, but not for a long time. Um, you know, and, and the reality is they're probably hard to drive on at the moment, but it's a lot easier driving on roads with huge potholes than it is driving, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, through these fields and through these natural features. So, guys, I'm just going to skip forward real quick, and I want you to note how much, as always, how much ground the Russians have taken in the last month. And if you can see anywhere that the Ukrainians have been pushing back, please let me know. Can you remember on yesterday's video, guys, or the day before when I said they're going to use this? Let me zoom in. I said they're going to use this river here as a handrail because you can't defend. You need a natural feature to defend behind. You know, you contrary to what most politicians think, you can't just draw. Well, you can, but it won't hold. You can't just draw a line in the sand or the, or the mud, as it would be in this case. You know, you need something to, you know, as a defensive position. 
So it looks like, and again, guys, I said this, like, go check my last video. I said the Russians will push up this river, whatever it's called, you know, and they will use that as a defensive line. And this also is, you know, in that range of 10 kilometers from the, uh, from Pokrovs. Let's just check from there to there. 9.88 kilometers. So that's well within range of 120 millimeter more rounds. So what you would see, what you're going to see is the Russians push up this river. I'd say they'll probably get to this junction here and then they may start pushing north. Again, you've got to, you know, when I was uh, when I was doing junior commanders courses in the military, I, you know, I, and in fact, you know what, guys, from day one week when I can remember my, you know, instructors in the military saying the ground dictates your movement. Let the ground dictate your movement. So the ground will always dictate where you where you put your artillery, where, where you form defensive positions, where you deform, uh, sorry, where you perform, you know, um, attacks, where you perform you know, all your um, tactical manoeuvres. So they're going to push up this road, uh, up this river, guys. You know, I don't know what defence is in this town here. I would, say, I would suggest minimum because of the uh, because of the proximity. So they're going to push up this river and then they will push north here. Guys, look, you've got these defensive lines here and that's what they're going to use. Again, I may be wrong. We'll see, Only time will tell. But that's the situation on the ground in Ukraine at the moment. Guys, remember what I said and what I've been saying all along about 120 millimeter mortar. Well, it turns out that the Ukrainians 120 millimeter mortar isn't that good. So from this article here, uh, so from this article here, guys, Ukrainian war briefing, Ukraine pulls back 100,000 mortar rounds after failures. Um, let me just read it down here, guys. So th this is the important bit. Ukraine's defense ministry is investigating defective mortar shells after at least 100,000 Ukrainian made 120 millimeter mortar rounds had to be removed from the front line. So this mortar system, guys, is that it? Uh, yeah, that is it. So this mortar system, it's... It's a key weapon system because it can be used by frontline troops. It can be used with limited or no experience. Although to use it effectively, yes, of course, you need a lot of training. You need, of course, you need a lot of experience. But once these things are bedded in, once they're locked onto targets, it's very easy for anyone to put those, um, you know, bombs down the tube. Soldiers began saying in early November that the rounds failed to explode, remained stuck in the launcher or fell off target. So if the Ukrainians have a good supply chain, why is it failing? Why have they had to pull 100,000 um, rounds of ammunition off the front line? Remember what we said, guys, like yesterday's video or the one before. The, the Russians are producing in three months what the European Union are producing in one year. And guys, this is just evidence of it. If the Ukrainians weren't running out of ammunition, they wouldn't have to manufacture it in such supply themselves. Uh, according to a to private Ukrainian TV, one plus one, the defense ministry confirmed it had stopped using them on the front line until the cause of manufacturing manuf malfunction, sorry, is determined uh, and sees part of the supply. Early findings led to, sorry, pointed to poor quality powder chargers or violations of storage requirement. Now, guys, uh, it could be a little bit of both, but this thing here powder chargers when people talk about munitions and manufacturing capacity and we have these generals and colonels come on the tv and they're talking about you know how we can produce the best stuff with the best you know the best reliable stuff and it's more sophisticated guys ultimately ultimately this all comes down to gunpowder and explosives now, there's only a limited amount of companies who can produce gunpowder and who can produce explosives at scale, at the scale that is going to be needed for this conflict. Remember, conflict of an industrial scale. The European Union's industrial base is already failing. We know this because the Russians are producing in three months what the European Union is producing in, um, in a year. So, you know, when everybody's talking about, you know, the drones and, the, you know, and all the rest of it, we need to bring it all back to the base materials, which is gunpowder, which is explosives. And those things, guys, you know, nobody's nobody's giving much thought about those. Whereas the Russians, they produce them in huge quantities. And if you've got the raw materials in huge quantities, which the Russians do have, then you're on the front foot because everybody else is playing catch up. 
So what else have we got for you guys? We've got the um, the British guy, guys. So there's a British guy who's been captured in Ukraine. Um, you know, he's been paraded on the Russian state TV. Um, in yesterday's live stream, people were saying, will he be involved in a prisoner exchange? So probably yes. Now, a lot of people are worried for this guy's safety and, you know, quite rightly so. But what I will say is, there's three initial phases of capture and this guy's in phase three at the moment so you've got your first phase of capture which is the most dangerous so that is your literal you, you know your initial when you're captured so at that point you've got people with you know you've got the people who've captured you they've got itchy trigger fingers it's you're not documented you're not you're not documented um you know it would be very easy for you not to become a prisoner if you know what i mean for you not to be taken prisoner the, the other option if you're if you if, if the bad guys have got you it, it's very easy at that point In, incidentally it's also that's also the, the the most likely time you can escape so it's a big risk if you want to try and escape at that point you know that you've got a high likelihood of somebody giving you a nine millimeter paracetamol or something but that, right there and then in that phase one of capture, that's kind of the easiest time to escape. But also it's the it's, it's the highest amount of, um, you know, threat for you. You can expect at that time to uh, to have to be treated, to be to be well conditioned by the enemy troops at that point. They will condition you well. They will condition you for interrogation. Now, looking at this guy, I don't know when. Let me just have a look if I can see when he was captured. But he doesn't look like he's been conditioned for um, interrogation at all. Um, anyway, but then you move on to the second phase of interrogation. This is where it's going to be slightly, a little bit uncomfortable for you. Let's just say that. So this is when you're going to get your, un, this is when you're going to get the, the type of interrogation you would historically think of by the Russians. It's going to be difficult. You know, you're going to be under a lot of duress. They're going to be trying to be find, they're going to try and find out how much information you need. And do you need to be put, put f- push forwards for further exploitation? That's phase two. That's usually done on the battlefield. And then phase three, where this guy is now, this is, you know, he's been taken out of his interrogation, although he'll probably still be interrogated, although I would assume they've got all the information they need from him. Um, He will be sent back to a third location. This is usually in enemy territory land. But, 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 he's documented now. He's, you know, he's been paraded on TV. So the Russians have... You know, they're, they're showing, they have, um, you know, they're taking custody of him. And at this point, guys, regardless what you guys think, you know, he, he is actually in the safest place as far as um, prisoners of war are concerned. Because at this point, guys, you know, it, it, you know he, he, it's very difficult for him to be, you know, for him to go missing. You know, he, people know he's there, he's documented. And they are three phases of capture, basically, guys. One, two, and three. And right now, guys, he, you know, although it doesn't seem like it, it's counterintuitive. For his personal safety, he is in the safest place right now um, where he is. And the fact that he's been paraded on TV shows that they're using him as a bargaining tool. They're going to, you know, and he'll, I would suspect, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, he'll come out and he'll be saying things like, you know, I don't agree with the Ukrainian war. I don't agree with X, Y, and Z. I shouldn't have been here. I made a mistake. And that's to act as a deterrence. That's to act as propaganda. And that's the way it's going to happen, guys. I would suspect at some point he will be involved in a prisoner exchange because don't forget, you know, the Ukrainians have got a lot of prisoners of uh, on from the Russian side. And these prisoner exchanges, um, you know, they happen quite often. They've been happening quite often in this conflict. <laughs> So the also the Ukrainian uh, what well, you've got people right now in Kiev that sorry from from Ukraine from Kiev um, that are in South Korea talking about weapons aid and weapons supply and you know and supporting them militarily. I think this is going to happen, guys. Why wouldn't it happen right now? Why wouldn't you have North Koreans um, supplying? everything they can to the Ukrainians. Remember the, sorry, South Koreans, sorry, South Koreans, North Korean, North and South Koreans are at war, guys. You know, they've had a ceasefire that's, they've had a ceasefire since 1953. Officially, North and South Korea are still at war. The North Koreans have supported the Russians and they've got troops in the Kursk region. So we're told, we don't know if there's any troops gone into Ukraine yet, but when that does happen, guys, that's going to be a massive move forwards. Not really on the front line, not really on the battlefield, but it's going to open up a lot of doors and it's going to ask a lot of questions of a lot of these, um, you know, 
these movers and shakers and politicians and people who think they know what they're talking about. But why wouldn't the South Koreans, who are already at war officially with the North Koreans, why wouldn't the South Koreans help the Ukrainians? Why wouldn't they give them weapons? Why wouldn't they give them manpower? I've heard that there are already delegates from South Korea in Ukraine helping with inter interpretation, helping with interrogation. So I don't, I, you know, there's nothing on mainstream about that, guys. That's just rumors that I'm hearing. So when we talk about boots on the ground and when we talk about, you know, um, the government saying, oh, there's not going to be boots on the ground. And I, you know, I've been saying it's an inevitability. So let's just see what our infamous foreign secretary, David Lamb, has been saying. We're not sending troops into Ukraine. And this point's key, guys, here at this time. So that doesn't mean so the whole statement, we're not sending troops into Ukraine. It's false because at this time cancels the first bit out. Foreign Secretary David Lamy will preserve its long standing commitment to keep troops out of the theatre of action. So if you guys remember from the map that I just showed you, the theatre of action, I would say you could, you know, would be east of the River Dnipro. So when we're talking about we're not going to put boots on the ground right now, of course, when he said that, they are, you know, it's true. But the next morning he could change his mind and put boots on the ground. The fact that they've not ruled it out is the main thing here, guys, you know, and that they're going to keep the British troops out of the theatre of action. You see the rhetoric now building up, as I said it would, the rhetoric building up for boots on the ground. You know, and again, you know, he, he shouldn't be in that position, guys. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll put all these links in the description. But what they're talking about there is, you know, the theatre of action. It's exactly what I've said will happen. They're going to push the NATO troops, British forces, French forces, whoever that is, guys. It doesn't really matter at this point, but it's an inevitable. Right now, guys, it's an inevitability. When, you know, people last night were asking on the live stream, when I gave, you guys were pushing me, I said 31st of, um, 31st of December. What needs to happen is the landmines that have been gifted or given to the Ukrainians or whatever by the United States, they have to get from point A where they, where they are. They have to then get pushed all the way up to the front line. They need to get deployed. And then whoever's observing whatever, you know, special forces, guys, uh, diplomats, international observers, I don't know who it is, but whoever's observing this, they need to see these landmines in action and they need to understand that they're going to be wholly ineffective. And guys, you know, they are going to be ineffective. Why? Because they're only effective if you have that sort of risk appetite. They're only effective if you don't care about pushing cattle through a landmine uh, field, through a, through a minefield. If you don't care about, you know, pushing horses, sheep, um, cows, pigs, push those through the landmine first. And then who do you push through? Well, you know, the Russians are pulling, con uh, you know, convicts out of jail. They've got a ton of North Koreans that they probably don't care that too, too much about. Now, when I say they don't care about the North Koreans, what I'm saying is they probably don't care about them, you know, as much as they care about their own Russian troops. When you're, you know, if you're on the front line and you've got a Russian commander on the front line, who is he going to send charging through a land through a minefield? Is he going to send his own guys or is he going to send these new North Koreans through? You know, and they're the decisions that these commanders are going to have to make on the front line. Now, of course, the Russians don't, you know, they don't just want all their guys to be blown up. It makes no sense for that. But the Russians have a bigger risk appetite than we do in the West. The Russians will accept a casualty rate that we just wouldn't accept in the West. So, you know, when people say that, you know, the, you know these landmines are going to have to going to be effective. And let's be real, guys. You know, how many landmines do we think we're going to have to lay down in a, I don't know, a kilometer by a kilometer patch? It's a lot of landmines. Now, you can multiply that by the front line in Ukraine. And don't forget, once the Russians have made entry through that through one landmine field, they can just push all their troops through that area and then, you know, they can just circumvent the rest of the landmines. Uh, the landmines. So the reality is, guys, these landmines, they're going to be they're ineffective. They're ineffective from day one. And this is a last ditch effort to try and form some sort of defensive line, form some sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe they're going to be used as, um, you know, so the Ukrainians can retreat behind the minefields. I genuinely don't know, guys, but what I do know is they're not going to be effective. They're not really going to slow the battlefield down at all. From, we've got an aircraft flying over, low flying. 
So what you, what you can tell 100% though, guys, is the Russians are making ground every day. It's only a matter of time now before that city of Pokrovs has become encircled. There's going to be a pincer movement on it. The the Russians are, like I said, they're going to come up that river. They're going to continue west on that river, you know, handrailing that river. They're then going to push north. And at that point, they'll come in from, this, from the north. Again, you know, things may change on the ground, but that's the way it looks at the moment. So the nuclear threats, guys, the nuclear threats in Russia. I mean, this is absolutely insane. There's talk now about the Ukrainian, the, the Americans giving the Ukrainians nuclear weapon. You know, just the fact that this is a, that they're talking about, this says a lot. Now, you've got to understand the political spectrum of these talks. So just for argument's sake, say that I'm Zelensky and I want, you know, I don't want people to think I'm weak. I don't want pe th people to think I can't do the job. So before I even announce something, I'm going to make sure it will happen. Before I even announce something, I'm going to make sure that it can happen. So if we look back, then, you know, Zelensky's initial plan for, you know, his road to peace or whatever, whatever he presented to the United States, this was the the ukrainians either getting acts you know either getting membership to nato or developing their own nuclear weapons now that was i think that was floated around october time i think maybe even a little bit before but that was the plan that was presented and remember guys okay if, if you're a pol any politician now okay you're not going to ask for something or propose to achieve something if you know you can't do it because you're just going to have egg on your face. So just for example, say that, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm Rotherham Council and I want, and I, and I come up and I say, guys, listen, I am going to get all the migrants out of migrant hotels. I'm not going to say that because I know, well, I could probably do it. I would, I, I, I'm, I'll go into that in a different video, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Your politicians are not going to make any claims if they know they can't do them. So when they make, because it just gives them egg on their face. So if I'm Zelensky and I come up there and I say, I want X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to do that before I've spoken to the people in charge of X, Y, and Z, and they've assured me that they can achieve it. Otherwise, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to say, I want to produce X, Y, and Z, and I'm just going to have egg on my face if it can't. If I go back to them and they say, no, mate, you can't do that. Yeah, it's just impossible, you know. So that's why it's going to happen. So when this talk and these discussions of nuclear weapons happen, they've probably already happened behind closed doors. Remember the analogy I gave you when I saw the video of, um, I think it was Zelensky and um, Keir Starmer talking, and then there were the doors behind him. And it was just very poignant to me because I could probably assume that just behind those doors, there was the the attaches and the aides from both, both of those delegates talking in a back room and sorting things out and then the pomp and circus was Keir Starmer and you know uh, Zelensky shaking hands and having a fake conversation so the rhetoric and the talk of nuclear weapons it says to me it's already in advanced stages and the Ukrainians are more than likely going to get these they asked for F-16s, they got them. They asked for, you know, long-range weapon systems, they got them. They asked for main battle tanks, they got them. You know, and right now we're, we, 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 we've become, we've reached a critical mass now where we, you know, the West can't stop this, can't stop supplying. Otherwise, you know, we, we're going to lose so much more. So I would also say that the talk of the nuclear weapons, I'd say it's non-talk anyway, because I would suspect that the Ukrainians are more than capable and they more than have the capacity to build their own nuclear weapons. They have a, you know, they have their own nuclear power plants. They have a lot of them. I mean, electricity is still ridiculously cheap out, out there in Ukraine, even compared like compared to the United Kingdom. I don't even know how that happens, guys. You know, the Ukrainians' power grid is getting hit all the time. They're losing power generation plants. They're losing substations. And still, it's less than half the price of energy in the United Kingdom. I've no idea how that even works. But the Ukrainians have a huge, um, you know, the, the Ukrainians have a huge nuclear power power uh, capacity with that they have the technology and the understanding of nuclear physics they also have huge industrial bases not least in uh Dnipro, which the russians are pushing towards at the moment and kremenchuk so these two areas you have you know the, the big industrial bases who can produce the correct um tooling and machining to make one of these things happen unless you know and it wouldn't surprise me if there's still nuclear physicists 
who remember how to make these from the Soviet era because it's not that long ago, uh, 1993, when Ukraine was a nuclear superpower. They had nuclear weapons, but, you know, when they gained their independence, they gave up their nuclear weapons and said, listen, we don't want to be a threat to anyone. Here's our nuclear weapons. We're just going to be peaceful. And, guys, you know, that is just, you know, it just shows you you can't give up these nuclear weapons because, you know, the only way to have peace in this in the world that we're at at the moment is peace by superior firepower. It really is. Guys, I am going to leave it there. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, I'm going to leave it there, guys. Uh, I'm going to do another video later about the state in the United Kingdom, about conscription, how I see it rearing its ugly head again, but it's not going to be framed as conscription. It's kind of going to be you know, people are going to be forced into it another way. But anyway, guys, I'm going to mag to grid. I'll get you guys another video later.